Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Welcome to our distinguished panel, uh, panel members. And thanks, Jesda, for organizing this, uh, what I think will be a very interesting and lively session. Uh, my name is Louis de Montpellier. I'm uh, moderating this panel. If you have easy questions, you can ask me. If, if you have difficult questions, please ask the panel. <laughs> and I'm very happy to moderate this session about the specific challenges and potential solutions for bridging scientific breakthrough, scientific uh, discovery and financing, and especially the crucial questions of the funding of science and technology for the common good. How do we go from private sector financing, public sector financing, but for the good and the well-being of all, of humanity. Uh, considering the many aspects of the question and the diverse background of our panel, uh, we should expect this to be a lively debate <laughs> and uh, conversations. Um, please also note that the session, as all, will be recorded as Jesda Summit proceedings and uploaded on our website. The question of, is, is recognized by Jesda as being uh, crucial, and actually it sits there as the fifth step of the Jesda Breakthrough Science Radar. I can read it from here on your right and my left, impact funding. So it is. And it's not the easiest of steps, I would think, uh, in this. And I could prepare, propose a general introductory assessment that the funding of technological developments for the common good is not happening, you know, has not been happening for the last decades at the scale and with, for the benefits of society that we need to aspire to. I mean, an example is how nationalistic the, the first responses were for the COVID-19 COVID uh, crisis. But I would today, unfortunately, immediately add um, that this could prove to be especially challenging today, in today's circumstances, and for the years to come. Indeed, considering the news and expectations when you open the newspapers about inflation, upcoming uh, recessions, deglobalization, <laughs> economic fragmentation, not to speak about geopolitical confrontations and war, I mean, as an economist, you will forgive me not to be extraordinarily widely optimistic about the financing of fundamental science for the common good. But fortunately, I'm joined with, uh, with, with a group of experts who together have more than 150 years of experience in this domain and who can hopefully bring us some hope in the, and, and some you know, way of thinking and solutions in the way we could organize ourselves and we could inspire the financing for scientific breakthrough, breakthroughs for, for the common good. So introducing uh, the panelists uh, from uh, the far left, Francesca Spatolisano is the United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordinations and Interagency Affairs in the Department of Economics and Social Affairs. And she brings 30 years uh, oh, more than three decades of experience at the crossroads uh, for the global architecture of how to finance science, to create international, uh, international agreements of financing science and technology. Next, we have Bill Egme. Uh, Bill is managing partner at the Vibranium Capital Group, a private investment holding company focusing on skilled tech-enabled assets primary in Africa. And uh, Bill brings also decades of experience at the highest level of uh, several multinational companies, especially Coca-Cola, and especially focused on emerging markets. We have uh, Nilo Maria Katawi. Maria is a global uh, board member of Open Society Foundations but she was also Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce from 96 to 2005. And before that, she had two decades of experience at the World Economic Forum, so as, as a managing director. <laughs> so she has been at the crossroads of about everything, I would say, from business, from financing, from, uh, from trade associations, and from open society. And to my immediate left, we have Kate Fox uh, from Bailey, uh, is a partner at Bailey Gifford, 
the famous investment managers into growth societies, in growth companies. She's an investment manager on the positive change strategy, a global equity strategy with dual objectives to generate attractive investment returns and to contribute to a more sustainable uh, and inclusive world. So I would like to, we don't have that much time, but I, I would like to organize these sessions in, in two rounds of main questions and main interventions from the panelists. The first one is, based on your experience, based on your, your long journey of your executive positions right now, what are the main challenges? What have you seen as main challenges? But what are the opportunities that you could see in terms of financing, funding, you know, gathering, uh, uh, asset gathering for the common good, uh, for financing science to the common good. And then the second round, I would like you, really you to focus on solutions in this very challenging environment, where there are the few things from your institutions or from where you see from, from, the, funding, from the finance community that you would see could really bring a breakthrough uh, as Jesda is proposing it. And then we'll take questions from, from the audience. And then finally, we'll have the great pleasure to have uh, concluding remarks from uh, Professor Patrick Ebischer, uh, who doesn't need a lot of introduction. He's uh, the co-chairman, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the uh, co-chairman of CESDA and um, uh, uh, the honorary president of EPFL. And he will give us the concluding remark about this crucial, uh, th this crucial uh, question of funding uh, science for the common good, and also maybe make some important announcement. So thanks, thanks very much for being here. So going into the discussion, and Kate, if I could begin with you. Okay, you represent here the hard-nosed financing, but you, you believe that private sector investment, you know, can really be a driver of parting shifts because your company, uh, you invest into companies that you define yourself with products and services providing solutions to global challenges and for the long term. Exactly what we're speaking about. How, how do, you, uh, do you see that happening from your experience uh, with examples? And what are the main challenges? Sure, well, um, when I had the uh, honor of um participating in Chester virtually last year, um, where I was trying to identify scientific breakthroughs that might be investable on behalf of our clients. <clears throat> I didn't for a moment think that I'd be presenting on a panel in a year's time. <laughs> so <laughs> very humble to be here with such esteemed colleagues. Um, so yes, you're right. We are investing with two objectives, which we believe are of equal importance and that they really are complementary of one another. So we think that we can deliver attractive financial returns on behalf of our clients and play a role in contributing towards a more sustainable and inclusive world through investing in public companies whose products and services are providing solutions to global challenges. And this approach is really um, based upon three core beliefs. The first one is that capital has the potential to be a powerful mechanism for change, that investors can play an important role. I think that Jesda is doing a great example of showing the different stakeholders that are needed to try and promote scientific breakthroughs and address global challenges. The Sustainable Development Goals call into action all members of society, governments, businesses, investors, and individuals. So investors who take a thoughtful, a responsible, and crucially a long-term approach can really contribute to helping individuals grow their savings, but also towards societal development um, and to the benefit of the planet. So I think we've got a responsibility as investors. The second core belief in what we're doing is that I think this provides a fantastic opportunity because companies whose products and services are providing solutions to global challenges, whether it be companies that design and manufacture electric vehicles or companies that are providing renewable energy, companies providing access to digital education tools, <clears throat> they're going to prosper over the long term. There'll be growth businesses and over longer periods of time, the market rewards that. And so investors can grow their capital and their savings. It leads me to the third core belief, 
which is related to the first two. So in order for us to live up to this responsibility as investors, and in order for us to capitalize on the opportunity that presents, it takes a long-term approach and a thoughtful approach. If I may, I'll take both in turn. The thoughtful approach is required because the challenges that we're facing as a society today, they're complex, they're wicked. If you think about the interplay between them, that makes it even harder. So, for example, we might be able to address the fact that there are hundreds of millions of people who are still undernourished through introducing industrialized farming techniques. But those industrialized farming techniques come with an environmental cost. They consume a huge amount of water, contribute to emissions, and are the large contributors to biodiversity loss. Just last week, we were in discussion with Peter Brabeck around biofuels to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. But biofuels can require a huge amount of water. So it's really complex. It takes a thoughtful approach, and crucially, it takes a long-term approach because these challenges aren't going to be addressed with a quarterly or an annual mindset. They're going to take years, if not decades. Now, unfortunately, I think this is where the investment community has really let itself down because it's become far too short-term and far too, focused, far too narrowly focused, focused on shareholder returns. With that long-term view, you naturally think about what a company's role is in society and how it can contribute towards society and the public good. And that long-termism is what really attracted me to the JESDA conference last year, to be talking about scientific breakthroughs of the next 25 years. We don't find that in the investment community. Kate, thanks very much. You know, I'm going to think that I hope that more investors had your mindset, but that's very interesting how to spread that out. Francesca, turning to, to you, if we can, we've heard what a very you know, focused investor can do, is trying to do, and is success, successfully do, has been successfully doing for a few decades. But coming from a totally different angle, the global financial architecture, the global diplomatic architecture, how do you see then the spread from you know, in, uh, scientific great, great investments and the common good within this? this uh, architecture. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored that this is a, a great uh, place to exchange ideas and anticipate, uh, try to do these scenarios. You know, we are in a situation worldwide, globally indeed, where uh, um, I don't have to reiterate all the gloomy picture you gave, but there are a hundred million of displaced people. There are millions and millions who died from a pandemic and still it's not over. There are, uh, of course, uh, uh, consequences on climate, which might be on the verge of the tipping point. I mean, we, we are not doing very well. If you look at the world, inflation is coming up. Um, food and fuel crisis is the consequences of the invasion of Ukraine. And I would add rising inequalities, because all this is, has an impact on our societies. People are at the core of what, of course, at the UN, we, we try to do the, the list of the SDGs you have, uh, I'm very glad to put out there in, in so big and bold colors show that we, uh, when we say SDGs, which is an acronym and most people don't even know, in fact, we are talking about people needs. We're talking about clean water. We're talking about food and energy, talking about decent job and gender equality. So this is what we try to pursue, this kind of core values, and to help countries to deliver on these core values. So. On top of that, of course, we have uh, uh, the, the transformation due to the incredible pace of new technologies, which is a cross-cutting challenge for many sectors. And therefore, all this calls for us to make choices, collectively and individually. Choices are what uh, is in our power to do. And so if we make the right choice, we may address the the challenge we have, and if we don't, we may create even more problems, more divisions, more radicalization, more difficulties for all of us. So in a, in a way, if you want to use the words of Mariana Mazzucato, you can talk about the mission economy, which means indeed that to put the purpose in front of all our activities and the purpose, uh, the values you were mentioning, uh, uh, the, the alignment with the SDGs, the sustainability, are what we think is a common reference and should be kept as a common reference. I am glad to say that um, at the United Nations General Assembly in September, 
this recommitment uh, was very clear in spite, uh, uh, let me underline, in spite of the geopolitical divisions, in spite of the fact that the situation today globally is very different from what generated that consensus in 2015, we still have governments, luckily, coming to the UN and telling us, yes, this is what we want to do. We don't know exactly how long it will take, probably will take longer than what we thought, because we are not there in terms of keeping the, the right pace, but that's what we have to do. So the financial system and the business and the communities and the civil society have a common task, and this is what we try to facilitate at the UN through our various activities. In particular, you ask about the financial and economic system. The Secretary General has been very clear, the global financial architecture is not geared to deliver these kind of objectives, clearly not. So we have to look into this, we have to incentivize the multilateral development banks to do their job a little bit better and take maybe a little bit more risks. We have to make the investors, as you were saying, Kate, very much more aligned with the SDGs and this uh, of course, you can do it in a number of ways. It can be by incentive, it can be by regulation, it can be by stick instead of carrots. I mean, there are all the tools you want, but you have to do that. That's our message. Thanks very much, uh, Francesca, for this landscape, <laughs> <laughs> which, are, which are bringing in, in themselves a lot of challenge. Bill, turning to you, I mean, you have spent your life bringing value to the Global South and uh, you're totally focused on that. Um, what do you see, what have you left as the main challenges and what do you see as the challenges and opportunities to bring financing to emerging markets, emerging countries in the domain of, of science breakthrough and uh, developing technologies? Well. Well, for me, the easiest way to think about this is in two different aspects. One is a pull aspect, and the other is a push aspect, where on one hand, I think, in the global south, we have to do a lot more work to be able to attract, create the right kind of attractive investment environment to attract risk capital into our markets. And we, there's a whole litany of things that need to be done to create the right kind of investment environment. But I, let me just focus on three key aspects that I, I'm sure the entire audience is, is familiar with, which I think are key imp impediments at this point. Number one is still the common discussion around uh, better handling corruption. And I think corruption is a huge disincentive but it also creates, destroys the ecosystem that you need to have for investments to work well. Because it's, it destroys the infrastructure that you need, it destroys the, the processes that you need, and we need to do so much more work. There's a lot of progress, but there's so much more work needed to do to contain and reduce the negative impact of corruption in our markets, very obvious. The second aspect for me is always around policy and regulatory uncertainty. Investments do not like an environment where the rules of the game are not very clear. And to the extent that we're able to map out the kinds of policies that help minimize the risk by providing some degree of certainty, and we're better equipped to implement and deploy those policies that we have on paper, these are all things we can do to attract more in investments on, on, on the continent. And the third aspect is something which we don't talk about very often. We, as the entrepreneurs in these environments, have to convince risk capital that we have the unique skills to better manage risks that are inherent in these environments. There's no question that operating in the global south has huge complexity and high risk. But I also think that within this environment, you have the skills and the capability to be able to navigate through all of that risk and reduce the impact of that risk. We have to be able to better show that we have those skills and capabilities ready. 
So those are some critical components around creating a conducive environment to attract you know, more investment. On the push side, outlook, for me, it's more around supporting and promoting and showcasing innovation. There is a lot of local innovation that's happening. And um, there is probably the need to invest more in local scientific research that addresses local solutions or that adapts research that has been done elsewhere to our local reality. And that investment is required to power some of the entrepreneurship that would attract that risk capital. So that's one thing that our governments and the public, the public sector, the private sector have to partner to do a better job at. The other aspect for me is also around investing in the training, the training to support local entre entrepreneurship. And for me, it's a little bit different from putting kids through vocational training. And we're gonna train you to be an electrician or a plumber, and then we're gonna re release you out there. I think it's another step that's required around making sure that that local plumber has some supportive training around how do I set up a plumbing business and run my finances and invest in improving my skills, getting the right tools, being reliable to my customers, not just my technical skills. And that connection sometimes is, mi is missing. So there's a little bit of investment in training that's required. And for me, the last part is around creating the platforms to showcase local creativity, innovation, and successful entrepreneurship. You know, I, for me, the good example is, you know, we don't have enough platforms where the success of small local entrepreneurs is being shared with the risk capital that sits outside the global south. And we can do a much better job at being able to showcase some of what is happening locally. Great message to Jester as well, <laughs> in terms of integrating the global south as it is, has started already into this whole global effort. Maria, first, first conclusions of this panel, if we need interim conclusions. You know, you've been at a between business, uh, what I hope Public to call and civil life. society, <laughs> trade associations, you know, global thinking. What are the main challenges that you see? What are the main opportunities? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Francesco, you mentioned uh, Mariana Ma uh, Mazzucato. She wrote a fantastic book called The Entrepreneurial uh, State, I think mm -hmm. it was called, um, in which she shows that practically every great scientific breakthrough was financed publicly by the state, along with others. And big scientific breakthroughs, I think it's true, and I pick up what uh, you said uh, a minute ago, Bill, uh, the ecosystem, the supporting system for really great scientific breakthroughs is extremely expensive. And it's not always either terribly, uh, in early stages, terribly attractive uh, to, uh, to the uh, market uh, systems. Um, so it's always been a complex group of different pockets of finance that have led to the largest of the scientific uh, breakthroughs. Uh, I'll be realistic. That mostly happens in not so many places, that conjuncture uh, for the scientific breakthrough. And it's not realistic to think that it's going to happen everywhere equally. So I've been looking at the next step. And that is actually what happens after scientific breakthroughs and what perhaps some of our concepts should be on funding, uh, on putting together packages that use different uh, players. And that's in the commercialization, industrialization, and adaptation of scientific breakthroughs. I think it's there right now that we have the most possibility to make impact with our investments, our funding, our, and multiple, uh, multiple sources of, of that funding. We've seen adaptation. I, mean, I, I, I remind myself very often that quite a long time ago in the agricultural world, that happened. Multiple sources, of, first of all, for the scientific breakthroughs, including 
uh, research in Africa. There's a lot of seed, very interesting research agricultural that's happened in Asia and in Africa. The international funding, um, like CEPI, for instance, uh, uh, pulled together for the vaccine, uh, international funding, local funding. These combinations are, are, are really interesting. And for me, I think for the moment, the concentration focus also on local commercialization, industrialization, which did not necessarily happen recently uh, with vaccine production, for example, and the adaptation to local needs uh, of scientific breakthroughs is maybe a very profitable, if I could put it this way, a very positive way that we might um, uh, be looking uh, at uh, the impact of scientific breakthroughs uh, on our countries and our societies. Thanks very much, Maria. So, thank you all to have landscaped and also put out, you know, some opinions about generally what to do in the spirit, and also shared your beliefs in what you do with, with us. That's great. Now, let's be concrete. Let's turn to the immediate future, the, you know, building the, the future for financing, uh, you know, the, of, of the, the present. If you were to recommend, in the second round of questions, to recommend a few things to do by certain institutions, actors, platforms like Just and so forth, what would be your recommendations so that we leverage as much as possible you know, the means we have to finance science for the benefits of all? In this especially, I insist, challenging times that I have described at the beginning, where it is difficult to be optimistic, but we still can find solutions. Uh, Bill, if I can start with you coming, you came with clear um, recommendations in terms of education, in terms of um, um, investment, uh, in terms of showcasing but also in terms of tackling corruptions and, and tackling policy uncertainties. Who needs to do what? How, how do we need as a society to think about this, those challenges in terms of solution-minded? So, you know, one way of looking at this is if you just start with some of the key obstacles, again, that are quite relevant for mobilizing risk capital and directing it towards the continent, and people are always looking for attractive financial re returns, right? Yeah. Um, in some cases, in our environments, that doesn't mean that you need to charge people more to get the better returns. Sometimes all they need is just, just reduce the cost of doing business in this environment. That's all you need. And so the work to put pressure on the public system, the public sector, to continue to improve the ease of doing business in, in our in our environments is quite important. And the work of people like the IMF that push by doing metrics mm. and show progress is quite useful. I think we've talked about supporting and enabling um, uh, ecosystems. What tools and systems do we need to put in place to facilitate being able to scale up um, innovation in these environments? And, and I think you know, it's very important that we, we create um, we expand access to some of these tools to the emerging markets. I, I think of a country like Kenya that is very progressive in terms of creating, build, putting in place the building blocks to encourage, um, you know, the social entrepreneurs to, to thrive in that environment. As Maria said, that requires a lot of investment. And that investment is not all being done by the public sector. This private sector is playing a big role in that. And philanthropy is also playing a big role in that. And that's very useful in trying to activate and progress um, those ecosystems. Um, but the biggest opportunities for me are around building bridges. You know, we have to be able to build the bridges that encourage the kind of, you know, how do you connect the research community with the innovators and social entrepreneurs to resolve when you have solution bottlenecks uh, how do you generate evidence to back solutions that have been... And I think of in, in the global south, I mean, the priorities for us are around feeding the people, educating the people, and providing them health. 
And when scientific research that's adapted to our environment runs into bottlenecks, sometimes you need the other, beyond scientific research, you need some um, incentive, some capital to, to push along the developments and to ensure that the solutions are discovered and applied and tested, and that you got evidence that they work. So I think creating the right platform for that to happen is very important. And something similar to what Jezza is doing here. It's about making sure you have an engagement platform where the different parties can come and dis discuss, debate their ideas. It's about frameworks for sharing. If we have to share information about progress on, on the scientific side, how do we share it? Um, how do we protect the things that we need to protect from a business perspective, but yet share the stuff that's for the common good? And how do we align to make sure that we have the same success metrics to show that we're progressing? Those kinds of platforms are required to bridge the gap between the private sector, the risk capital that looks to, to identify opportunities, the public sector that creates the radical systems, and then the scientific researchers who help find the solutions. Those kinds of platforms we're in desperate need for. And of course, then the last aspect is the co-investment. Mm. I, I think the work that the DFIs, mm. and I don't think they get enough credit, the IFCs and the DFC, all the, the European development banks do to support and subsidize some of the risk that's been taken by the African, or the, the, the African um, social entrepreneurs to build some of the in ecosystems and infrastructure required to accelerate development on the continent. They're doing a great job. We, we know they can do more, but I think the work they're already doing should be recognized and supported and, and publicized. Very interesting. Maybe we should invite more DFIs to, to just that. <laughs> <laughs> Francesca, if I may turn to you. Uh, you explain vividly and interestingly what the atmosphere around these questions at the United Nations. Thank you very much. You quoted the SDGs. There are 17 of them. Mm. Where do you think the, you know, the global infrastructure and the UN especially should really focus to make a real difference in the, these very challenging mm -hmm. times for, for this purpose of financing science? Well, that's a very challenging question, of course. That's why I'm asking it. <laughs> <laughs> if I single out one SDG, I will not get a job next year. <laughs> 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 no, seriously, the, the, if you want, the, the beauty of this big framework is that they are all interconnected. That these, uh, these objectives cannot be delivered independently. So we, we try to push each one, of course, in his own merits with different uh, mechanisms that we have in place. Because uh, think of gender uh, uh, parity. If you don't uh, free the resources which the women of this world constitute and make them uh, able to contribute to, to the building of a peaceful democratic society, why, uh, why wouldn't you do that? Well, because of traditions and, and power <laughs> struggles and so on and so forth. But uh, that would help to deliver, for instance, on a number of other um, goals that are there. So, uh, if you don't have a climate, uh, a, a, you know, a, an environment which is uh, supportive of health, you probably have a lot of more cost in the health system, and so on and so forth. So, it's very difficult to say, pick one, it will be the one. But there are cross-cutting uh, issues that uh, will accelerate, in fact, the delivery on a number of other uh, goals. And uh, I'm not going to list you, but I give you the reference, the uh, Global uh, Sustainable Development Report, which uh, is issued by a, a, a group of scientists appointed by the Secretary General every four years, is where we, we find that research and that kind of indications. Other things we do at the UN, indeed, other uh, uh, analytical tools that we provide uh, include the Financing for Development Report, which is uh, also a reference study each time. And it's not just a report, but provides recommendations about what tools might work in which situation, because I have here to 
to blow my horn, the UN, after all, are the place where every country in the world is there. Every country is represented, every country has a say, the North and the South. And this kind of exchange on a parity level allows us to keep a broader picture, not just you know, one side or the other, but allows to provide recommendations which are uh, the result of this kind of exchange and in the best case, of course, to provide consensus around those recommendations. Doesn't always work, but this is uh, the, the idea of the UN. And um, so there are these various reports. There is a UN technology facilitation mechanism whereby the scientific community is able to tell us you know, where the progress are. And now we would like to, of course, to strengthen the relation with the JESDA and, and this great initiatives that you are doing. At the same time, we provide, for instance, national science and technology and innovation roadmaps for the SDGs, so that each country has a roadmap of how the innovations technology could help its own situation to reach the SDGs. And we are even working at a global roadmap in this sector. And I could continue listing all the mechanisms and reports and knowledge that we provide. There is a Bridgetown initiative, which is about uh, financing uh, the, uh, how to restructure, if you want, the global financial architecture with a number of proposals, levy on fossil fuels, uh, increase, as I was saying, development bank lending, and so on and so forth. But all in all, of course, digital tax, the tax on uh, extra profits, which is very current debate. Uh, so there are, there are a number of tools, but I would like to say um, we don't only preach, we also practice, and let me give you an example. The UN Joint Staff Pension Fund, it's, it's a decent sized pension fund. Well, we have reoriented that so that it's now aligned and investing in sustainable um, assets. And that is uh, just to show that we also put our house in order, and that is what we call everybody else to do as well. Last point, we don't at the UN think that, what's, uh, that the current pace is enough to deliver, and we would like, and the Secretary General has done this through his uh, common, agenda, uh, common agenda proposals, to uh, really include more of the other stakeholders into this debate. Because uh, take the role of youth in climate change, what happened, the pressure from younger generation, younger people has been so strong on governments that there has been a shift, a real uh, acknowledgement that the action is now and not some future time. So we want to include more actors and, and put governments uh, together with these other actors so that there is a whole of society response. Thank you. Thanks, Francesca. Maria, turning to you, based on your experience, what you told us about the difficulties, about the challenges, about the public sector, which is high, today highly indebted uh, for, other, for other reasons, how are we going to finance science over the coming period in this very challenging time? I don't think that national uh, uh, financing will be so difficult. Um, uh, I believe public financing, but it's very national. And uh, perhaps the autarky <laughs> that is wished in uh, uh, scientific breakthroughs is not the best idea. Uh, let me argue that we shouldn't be looking for simple solutions here, and we should just fall back in love with complexity. Uh, not that it uh, stops one, not uh, because of uh, uh, blockages, but it is going to be complex, and we are going to have to have very interesting, very innovative, collective platforms of some sort, and you have mentioned already that, uh, uh, Bill, and certainly uh, JESDA is, is, in my case, uh, I think one of the most uh, important, and I'm sure that uh, Patrick has much to say on that. Uh, one of the uh, difficulties of putting together so many different kinds of financing from the private sector, from, as you have mentioned, um, 
and build a regional and international financial institutions that do absolutely, banks have been supporting a lot that's going on, is that there's always, there's a drag. It takes a long time. It is complicated. There isn't clear governance. Mostly when the UN comes, excuse me, Francesca, and says, you know, would you like to be a partner? They don't really want to be a partner. They want us to donate to something. And we do, because it's important. Um, so the way in which these things are put together shouldn't be a drag. And I would just argue and plead that rather than looking at all this complexity, oh gosh, I haven't got the time for this, um, look at that complexity as perhaps very interesting and very important if we can start not just to say nice words about getting these things together, but finding much more effective and efficient ways to do it. And that may take a couple or few, or at least start with some impartial platforms that is trusted and that can do that kind of job in a much more effective way. So that's a little bit what I would gar uh, argue for on the input on the scientific side, but on the other side that I mentioned before, I think we should concentrate and focus much more, much more uh, uh, concentration um, and thought on the commercialization and industrialization. That held back and has been holding back. Malaria that's coming along now, lots of vaccines, where are they going to be made? So far away that it takes a whole lot of expense and transport and so on. Let's start thinking also of the second stage after the input, the output in commercialization, industrialization, and adaptation to local uh, uh, conditions. Thanks, Maria. Turning to Kate, it is not yet concluding remarks, <laughs> but you know, we are back at the end, we have created, we are in market economics and in market financing. So what would you advise so that your type of investment you know, would, be, would be promoting, would be more of investments and would be promoting really the common, the common good by financing science and, and technology? Do you think, for example, that the ESG, ESG trend in asset management and the impact funding is really taking hold and developing as a potential avenue solution for promoting more and distributing more, commercializing more, as Maria is saying. First And second, I had another question for you, is how do you think, if we speak about impact funding, how do you think we can measure impact? <laughs> if it's every three months will not work, you have told us that. Yeah. Okay. What do we need to do? <laughs> what do we need to advise? Okay, so there's a lot there. Um, first yes. of all, I'd say that um, I, I agree that we need to have that combination of lots of different members within the sort of financing community and bring people together. And that is really complex. So if we can try and reduce the complexity and actually inject the sense of urgency to get us all together, that would be terrific. Um, in, in terms of how we sort of create th this movement and, and what's required for that, I think it it really comes down to that long-termism. Mm -hmm. um, because as I said earlier, with that long-term outlook, um, you naturally think about a company's role in society. What is, it in, what is its impact on the environment? Has it got a social license to operate, et cetera? Um, not just its, its role within society in terms of how it operates, but how it can shape society through the products and services that they're providing. I think the ESG and the impact movement that you reference, I would actually say that ESG and impact are interlinked, but actually quite distinct. To my mind, impact is much more forward-looking. It's thinking about the opportunities to drive change, um, whereas ESG in its current form is quite backward-looking. It depends on what is disclosed. It's more risk-focused. So this might not be such an optimistic um, response, but... My concern is that with the ESG agenda, we might lose sight of driving real-world impacts, mm -hmm. which is somewhat related to your question around reporting. Because reporting is really important because it holds us accountable to the objective that we've set to contribute towards a more sustainable um, and inclusive world. And investors who are contributing their capital will want to know what impact their capital's having. But it's really difficult because there's no standard um, way of doing this. There's no single metric that we can report on. And impact isn't always easily measurable. Uh, but it's crucial that we do it. 
So for us, we invest in 30 to 40 listed businesses. Um, so we know these businesses, I like to think we know these businesses well, we can spend the time, dedicate the time to identify metrics that can help us identify um, or, or observe what progress they're making in delivering positive outcomes and ultimately impact. But the rest of the investment community can't necessarily do that if they're investing in passive funds, investing in hundreds of different equities. They don't have the time and the resource to be able to do that. So then people default to ESG scores, um, which have their limitations because they're based on backward-looking data, what is disclosed. So I think that could be a real challenge for us as an industry because you, you manage what you measure. So that's great. People are managing for impact, fantastic. You know, but how do you measure that impact? And if people default to these ESG scores, my real concern is that we're not going to be managing real-world impact. Well, there was not 100% optimism on this, uh, uh, on this uh, panel. So now I'm ready to take uh, questions. I mean, we are ready to take questions. Um, is there a microphone which is roving around? Yeah, here in, in front. Yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, I'm from... <coughs> I'm from South Africa, and of course, African states, the discourse now is that African states entered an international system that was created under Western hegemonics, right? This idea of neoliberalism and constraining the abilities of the state and in favor of privatization. And of course, right, the, the history of international financing in Africa has been one of, you know, or one that is seen as imperialistic because it is seen as a, a, a political project of the economist or corporatist class that is extractive. So how do we improve the image of international financing where the public is taken into consideration but also safeguard um, private interests? But also how do we make sure that um, international financing is multipolar, right? So we're not focusing on New York or Washington or Brussels or even here in Geneva, but we make sure that financing is distributed equitably because we saw during COVID, um, even though we espouse um, values of multilateralism, in times of crisis, um, countries are very insular looking and therefore the, the, the notion of international cooperation is not something that states are in favor for. Thank you. So you have a question of image? representation and the question of distribution. But um, what about taking three questions and then uh, in the interest of time, you had a question. Yeah, Mariana Bosizan, I've been an impact investor for 30 years, struggling with exactly the same issue. How do we measure? Uh, the main measurement criterion for investing is uh, for profit only, that's finance, of course. We're slowly but surely trying to bring people and the planet into the uh, conversation, particularly within planetary boundaries if we want to survive. So my question to you is how can we change the metrics? What, uh, and you know, I'm asking this within the context of, of SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure uh, Agreement, the European one, um, and how long it's going to take. And the other question also with respect to the due diligence, which I, I think is key to aggregating the capital. Uh, how can we increase the due diligence process so that we facilitate um, you know, that investment? Thank you. Let's take a third question, and then the fourth one there. <laughs> Four questions for panelists. <laughs> Conrad Seifert from the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. And I really like the cultural remarks that Madame Katawi made. Uh, because I think this concentration of talent question is one of the key bottlenecks that we often see. Also because it solves often this need for platforms that we have to increase bandwidth between different actors. And I think the reality for, for which often the platforms fail is simply that people don't have enough time because everyone is already specializing on things in their corner and very busy trying to achieve their goals there. So time is simply the limiting factor. And I think that also means that, for example, a platform like Jester then needs to think about, okay, how do we maximize the bandwidth between actors when they are already in the same room? And often this only happens implicitly by everyone living in the same place, having shared social circles, etc. Look at Silicon Valley. And I think 
Um, yeah, we, we ignore that if we simply call for more platforms or more exchange. And I would be interested in better understanding what Madame Katawi would suggest to solve this. Germany, for example, has a big problem simply because it has no elite universities, so there's no concentration of talent, less information exchange, less idea development, etc. Maria, you're, you're, you're worried. Got out. <laughs> I'm going to take, I, there was a fourth question, and then over. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. Uh, so uh, we were, you were talking about uh, future financing and uh, uh, how it can impact our world, but uh, you didn't mention cryptocurrency. As I'm representative of youth cohort, uh, I can say that youth is really interesting now in investing in cryptocurrency itself. But as I can say, uh, when investing in cryptocurrency, it's risky. It's more risky than investing in gold or in sus more sustainable assets or physical assets. But how can it be... So now cryptocurrency is uh, more in private sector investment and how it can be turned into banking sector, how it can be turned into public sector investment and shape our future of financing, how it can be turned into safe, sustainable uh, currency. Thank you. Well, we don't have that much time, so... Uh, Is that all the time? Ask for that? Yeah, we have three minutes left. Okay. Yeah, we have okay. something like three minutes One left minute for each. four questions. <laughs> 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 so, Bill, um, I think you introduced the subject of the first questions about improved Im image and, you know, thinking about an exploitative or not. And, and, you know, how to finance equitably and to have the right representations? Well, I, I, I believe that um, the, the Global South is not going to erase the existing finance, global financing structure. All we can do is influence it and force it to adapt, right? Um, but I'll start with the caveat that we haven't been glorious ourselves in terms of tapping into that system and making use of the resources that we got. How many times have our governments been back to right of debt that was supposed to fund infrastructure? That's not the global fi finance infrastructure's fault. It's our own governance, you know? And so we need to also take some portion of accountability. What I think we can do a better job of is to ensure that um, As we tap into those resources, we're making sure that we have the right level of public accountability into how we use those resources. These resources are public goods. And put aside corruption, but not all of these funds are stolen. Some of them are actually used in projects that are poorly run, poorly managed, poorly delivered, and poorly maintained. That's up to us. We have the skills, we have the capabilities, we have the knowledge, we have the talent to do it. It's about organizing ourselves to turn those investments to deliver returns. It's one thing to make investments, but there's also work required to convert that investment into delivering returns. That's something that we have to own. And we have everything we need to do that. Thanks, I would like I'm aware of time. <laughs> I hope we'll get one more minute. Um, there was uh, the questions about the metrics from, from this lady and, and the increase in due diligence and so forth. Yeah, so Do you want to take this? Sure. Right. So I think with the metrics, um, our, our approach would be to try and you know, take a thoughtful approach to it and, and try and lead by example. Um, by focusing on those real world impacts and always trying to get better and evolving our process. Um, so we've been doing this for five years now, but we're always you know, tweaking it, improving it. Um, we can engage with broader organizations like the Global Impact Investing Network, um, keep, be aware of what's going on, but I actually find it probably more helpful just to do it ourselves and keep moving forward because quite a lot of these groups I don't know 
you know, if, they, if we get it's a bit like the complexity point about different you know, types yeah. of you know, blended finance, if you have too many people in a room trying to converge around a standard, you're going to lose sight of what it is that you're trying to achieve. So for us, it's having an awareness of what's going on at an industry level, but striving forward which what we believe in. Um, and perhaps it might take a little bit of speaking out around some of the regulatory backdrop, which is focusing more on the ESG type thing, which could be really dangerous. So I think we have a responsibility there as well. Um, and in terms of the, the due diligence, um, we try and get things audited by a third party so that our, our linkages to the SDGs and underlying indicators, et cetera, um, you know, to make sure that there's, there's real rigor there. Um, and also, I think it's important to be quite open in your reporting. So we talk about the positive contributors. There's no such thing as a perfect company. There are companies that will be negatively contributing towards the SDGs. And I think you've got to be transparent about that. So you've got to be consistent in your approach. You've got to be conservative in your approach. And you've got to be um, transparent in your approach. Thank you very much. Co going pick to up the... on that uh, just a minute and very yes. quickly. Um, sometimes it's probably more challenging to figure out exactly what your objective is and to set up your metrics in terms of the objective that you think you're going to get to, because trying to put metrics on governance has not succeeded. So let's see what we're trying to get to, get that objective, and then make our own metrics if we're going to get there. So that would be my contribution to that one. And that's a little bit also what a platform, a really good impartial platform would do, would be to take all this complex financing pieces and let's not drop them. They're excellent. Innovation, I'm always for trying and trying new ones and try to set those up with objectives and with some kind of, I wouldn't exactly call it total governance, but some kind of clarity to make things a little bit easier so that those partners can work together. And Maria, thank you very much. And, uh, and Francesca as well, I would like your, your view about the questions about the tension between you know, locals and globals in terms of creating the space to fund, to finance yeah. uh, science for the common good. Well, this, this excellent questions about, yeah. uh, about the ecosystem. I like what Bill said about building bridges and uh, trying to have uh, uh, the local uh, uh, level, you know, work with the global level, because this is what we need. We need to hear from the real uh, ground, from the real people, from the real issues that everybody uh, faces at the, at the ground level, so that we can build uh, a better scenario, a better um, uh, set of options, let's call it, for countries to apply. This is the role of the UN. We don't do things ourselves, we support better uh, uh, policy options for countries to choose from. And I go beyond the building bridges, I, I would say building consensus, because once you have, you know, heard everybody and included everybody, which we try to do, you, you certainly need then to make decisions. Maria was very clear about that. And decisions are made by consensus, unless you want to prevaricate, as uh, the first speaker was saying. And so that's the role of the UN, building consensus around sustainable uh, solutions. And, and that, I think, would be my, my invite. JESDA is doing this, and we are very happy uh, to, to hear more from you, to get you involved in what we do, and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you. I know we are out of time. We have not answered the cryptocurrency uh, question. I mean, cryptocurrency is a technological development. Um, Personally, a little bit skeptical that it is a real uh, financial development. Maybe Kate, is a, uh, would you use cryptocurrency to finance science? Um, for the I, common good? I don't feel um, sufficiently um, educated on cryptocurrency, I'm afraid, <laughs> to be able to call that. I think that there are opportunities for blockchain to help us and you know, when it comes to um, transparency over supply chains, et cetera, but cryptocurrency, I'm afraid I'm not going to take a view on here today. But, but there, are a there are related aspects that are working in Africa. So it's not the cryptocurrency that yeah. should be the focus, it's the blockchain it's technology, the blockchain technology and how that helps yeah. us to streamline uh, drive producti productivity, traceability through our supply chains. That's more important than cryptocurrency, which I think is a red herring. Professor Ubisher, if I can invite you to conclude. I'm glad you said it. 
<laughs> Thanks. So it's you know, my pleasure to try to give some concluding remarks to what was said <laughs> there. But let's say from, uh, I would like to take this from the angle of, of Jezda. And I think I'm coming back to what Maria has said, and I think this is very important. You know, we're living in an incredible time where we see scientific disruption at a pace that we've never seen. And this is really exponential, and it affects really what we do, who we are, and that's going to be even more important in the coming years. And the role of Geza was to try to anticipate. But as Maria said, you know, a lot of this comes from public funding. In fact, it is the top universities on average that are, you know, <laughs> developing those disrupting, disrupting uh, uh, innovation. They come, the problem, they come from quite a few, you know, about 100 top universities produce about 80% of the most important innovation. There's two exceptions now today is the, in the AI and quantum where some of the big companies, the GAFAs and so on, have top scientists that are really competing. So there's a second. And the second thing is something that we don't see because it's not transparent, is defense labs around the world. Those are the places where the disruption is happening. So what we've tried at um, GESDA is to try to have this map, as you've seen this radar, and you know, the difficulty is to try to see where it's gonna go in five, 10, 25 years. And the further out we are, the more difficult and the less probably, you know, <laughs> precise we will be. However, we absolutely need to anticipate their utilization. And that was, you know, the second part of the, the radar. This is what they summit, the VEST task force. It became what is now written in this wall, is to come from solution ideas, from the kind of you know, discussion that we're having here. But then the third part is really, in some of them, we're gonna to have to finance this. And why am I coming this, and this is very interesting, what kind of financing? You know, we're talking impact, we're talking about basic, what we as scientists call pre-competitive financing. And I think that's really the whole matter about us today. If you take as, you know, the key innovation, compute, uh, you know, quantum computing, we know it's just coming. You know, we don't know if it's five or 10 years, but let's say in this frame, this from decade, we will start to have the first utilization, you know, the first machine that will allow you to do it. You could do the same thing about human augmentation. You know, this is at the tip of our finger. Gene editing, those technologies are not 20 years or 30 years. We don't know how to use them. To some extent, if you want the people to benefit, you know, it will have to go through a normal economy. So the private sector will need, but before the profit, you know, the sector, the private can make its profit, it has also to participate in setting to some extent the rules, how we're gonna use those disruptive discoveries for the good of mankind, but also you know, for all mankind, because for now, yes, it is concentrated. If you look at compute, uh, quantum computing, it's a couple of countries, couple of companies. And that's where, you know, through those, this last year's summit and, and, and uh, through the various discussion we had through the years, we came with this idea of having this open quantum institute here in Geneva. It's a perfect city with the CERN, I don't have to say it back and so on. But we have not to create the new uh, quantum computing. The, the, the various labs and countries and countries will make it, but to be sure that we're gonna use them the proper way. And to do this, we're gonna have to finance this. We're gonna have to finance before it becomes, you know, an economic uh, 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 matters. And I think that's where you have to have this, you know, pre-competitive. I think it's everybody needs to be around the table. And that's what we've decided to do at uh, uh, JESDA is now after we've had the radar, which is the anticipator, where we had the accelerator with the solution ideas, we're ready now to create this impact forum with an impact fund for, for subjects that are highly disruptive, but to be sure that we're gonna use them the proper way. And that's all about the impact forum and fund. And that's where we're gonna rely on innovating new financing which is gonna be a public-private, by definition, where innovation, and it's not also the startup, the established companies, the publics, the philanthropies, but we need to get together. 
And I think what we would like to do during this coming year is to take the couple of examples that we have identified, but hopefully each summit we will have new ones. Some we're not ready. For example, if you're looking this year, we have the neural tech compass. We know, being myself a neuroscientist, I know that the brain machine interfaces, the chimeras are coming, and we don't know exactly how to use it. But I think this needs to be thought through. We need also to test case them, the use cases. And I think there are very few places, and I think that's, for me, part of the core mission of GESDA, is how to use them to develop the cases, but also to, for this we need to finance them. So I think it's to bring, I think, the scientific community to the table of the multilateralism. It is to ensure access to the benefits of science for the most world inhabitants. And I think it's also to make Geneva the place where you can discuss this. But for this, we will need financing. And that's why, you know, we're going to come back to some of you <laughs> to see if you're ready to participate to this, I think, essential part is learn how to use those disruptive discoveries before they escape us. So as to use them for the good of mankind and in a very inclusive manner. And I think if we achieve this with one or two, we will have, you know, set up the mission of JESDA. So this is, I would say, the third part of the rocket, which is the implementation. And for the implementation, we will need to have an impact forum and an impact fund. And that's really the ambition of today. And I think the panel today, you know, brilliantly illustrate the need to find this financing, both, you know, across the world, glo including Global South, because this is at the question at the heart of who we are and how do we want to live together and where, to some extent, on this planet. Thank you.